In this video, we're going to be taking a look at a number of different sharpening techniques to help you produce crisp, clean-looking images. Hi there, Michael Lushinovich here once again. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash vibrantshot, and also be sure to visit vibrantshot.com for a number of written articles and tutorials. So in this video, we're gonna take you through um, a number of different sharpening tools and techniques that I use for landscapes, architecture, and portraits, and we're basically gonna to touch on the various scenarios where each of them is applicable. So while there's really no right sharpening tool, our goal here is to just make you familiar with the different options that are available to you and kind of leave you to experiment with um, your own images to find the one that produces the best looking result for that particular image. So let's go ahead and get started. Now before we get into the actual techniques, I think it's important to kind of just mention what exactly sharpening is and what it does. Now obviously what it is is pretty clear. What we're trying to do is we're going to try and take an image that may not be nice and crisp the way we want it to because of a number of reasons. Maybe there's, you know, a bit of haze in the air that day. Obviously the lens itself may not be, well, no lens is perfectly sharp. There's always going to be a little bit of softness to the lens. So um, we're going to try and counteract that. And obviously there's other reasons for, for things not being sharp. You've got, you know, camera shake, you've got an item that's, that's moving. And um, luckily there are tools these days to help with almost all cases where there's blur um, or anything that's not as sharp as you want it to be. Um, now obviously they're not perfect. The ideal scenario is to have an image that is perfectly sharp out of the camera so that's why you want to do everything in your power to essentially get you as sharp an image as possible. Things like shooting on a tripod, shooting with prime lenses, um, all those things effectively help to give you a sharp image. Now obviously we're stuck with what we have and so that's why we have sharpening in uh, in post-processing and you know no matter how great your camera is and how great your ear is you're always going to want to be doing a little bit of sharpening to uh, improve the look of your image. So now sharpening itself what it's essentially doing is uh, if we go into an area like this very very closely what sharpening is basically doing is it's, it's boosting contrast um, along edges. So essentially it's finding areas where there's a transition from light to dark um, effectively. So in this area here, like for example in this, this dark spot, we shouldn't really be doing too much sharpening because there's no real transitions. Although if we zoom in a lot, we do see that there is some noise in here. And so noise, of course, is going to cause problems for our sharpening as well, because if we have uh, what we have here is essentially called luminance noise, which means that we've got, you know, noise that is either light or dark um, within an area, particularly, you know, shadows is, is where you're going to see it. So what sharpening is going to do, since it's looking for anything where there's a change in light and dark, like this here, for example, or any sort of noise that we may have in our shadows, it's going to try and amplify the contrast between that. So over here on this edge uh, where we have light color, what we're going to do is we're just going to try and lighten that up a little bit more. And then on this side here where it's dark, it's going to darken it a bit more. So obviously as we amplify the amount of sharpening, what you can imagine is that if we again go in a little bit closer, where we see these slight gradations over here where it's not, you know, we don't have a dark line and then a light line. Um, we do have a little bit of softness to transition through there. If we over sharpen essentially we're going to make this line completely black and then we're going to have white on the other side and nothing in between so it's going to create a very crunchy looking image um, and ultimately lead to what's known as artifacting so the same thing goes with noise um, wherever we have you know bits of noise like this where we have this little light dot over here and then dark around it what it's going to try and do is it's actually going to end up sharpening that so it's going to make whatever's dark around it even darker and the light noise is going to get even lighter so we're really just playing up that noise and amplifying it so um, obviously those are things that we're going to try and avoid when we're sharpening, but it's important to be aware of them and, and how they happen um, so that when we're actually doing our sharpening, we're, we're doing our best to avoid those sorts of things. So we're going to start things off with what's probably the most well-known filter, and that is the Unsharp Mask. So um, Unsharp Mask is used by many to just, you know, naively sharpen their images and away they go. Now for me, I typically do not use Unsharp Mask through the actual editing process. Uh, I'll use Unsharp Mask only for output sharpening, which um, essentially is just me taking the image, the final product, and resizing it to whatever purpose I need, and outputting it either for web use or for printing. Now um, that being said, we're going to talk about it in general, and then you can choose to use it wherever you need to. So uh, usually when I'm sharpening, I will create a copy of the, uh, the layer, or I'll create a smart object, so I'll convert the layer to a smart object, just going into uh, layer 
smart object and convert to smart object. So uh, if you do that, what you can essentially do is you can apply the sharpening and then you can reduce or increase the amount later if you choose that, you know, it, it doesn't quite work for you. So um, in this case, I'm just going to duplicate it. It just makes for easy demonstration. So let's just zoom in. Uh, again, before I apply a, a sharpening filter, I'll typically zoom into about one or 200% just so I can see the effect um, within the, um, the live preview. So I'm gonna maybe go up to about 100 here. And then we'll go into Filter, Sharpen, and Unsharp Mask. So with Unsharp Mask, it's a pretty straightforward filter to use. Essentially, um, you know, it, it, there's three sliders here. So it's not too difficult to learn. It's just a matter of understanding uh, what they do and, uh, and you know, how adjusting them affects the, uh, the level of sharpening. So I'll probably go up to 100% here, 200% in here, so I can really see the effect. And now, starting off with the first slider, which is the amount, you can basically just think of that as just sort of the absolute amount of sharpening that we are applying. So if we go up to, you know, 225, we see that we're sharpening more and more. And, um, and really what that means, going back to our discussion of what sharpening is, is that the more amount we push in, the more we're going to make the lights lighter and the darks darker in the area of transition. So wherever there's edges, um, whatever's on the light side is going to get lighter and whatever's on the dark side is going to get darker. And we can kind of see that right here as well. If we really punch up the amount, uh, so if we start at about 100 here, we see that in general it's making the image sharper. And you know what, let me just zoom in over here as well to like 400% so you can really see the effect. So, you know, again, if we, we toggle this on and off, we'll notice that, that that edge that's created over here becomes a little bit tighter, right? So um, the darks are getting darker and the lights around there are getting lighter. Now, if we punch this up to 200 or let's say 500%, we see that that line on the light side is becoming almost pure white and the black line is becoming almost pure black. And what that essentially leads to is what we call fringing, which is not something that you want in your images. And it's something that I see all the time in people's images. So it's really important to look out for that and make sure you're not over sharpening your image. Now, um, the radius slider is basically, it's, it's saying how much are we going to apply or what area are we going to apply that lightening and darkening effect to on the edge. So with 1.1, this is the effect. Now, if we punch that up, we see that obviously it's applying that to a much larger radius. And so now our fringe is essentially becoming huge. Uh, typically, I never really use a radius above one. Uh, usually my radius will be between 0.1 and one. So again, if we if we punch this up and then we reduce the amount, uh, we see if we kind of toggle that effect is that it's you know creating that sharpening further into the building and further out from the building. So again, radius I would typically keep it at you know around one pixel on a full size image. For output sharpening, uh, this will be anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3 depending on what resolution I'm outputting to. And uh, generally, the way I kind of tend to work is that the smaller the radius, the more I go up on my amount and vice versa. So if I um, go way down on my amount, I can increase the radius a little bit more and so on and so on. So with output sharpening, what I'm usually looking at is between 0.1 and 0.3 and the amount being um, around 300%. If I'm sharpening a full size image, I'll usually be in the 0.8 to 1 pixel range and the amount will be anything up to 100%. Now, threshold is just basically saying, okay, how, you know, how intense does the transition between light and dark have to be in order for me to affect that set of pixels? So again, if we kind of embellish this a little bit here, let's pump the uh, percentage up to somewhere around 135 and we'll increase our radius to two. So now if we actually start playing with this threshold, we see that the inside of the building is getting less and less affected by the sharpening because the transitions here are not that big. I mean, in these areas where we've got the, the lights inside the building it's quite large but in these areas where there's a bit of noise uh, it's getting less and less the effect is getting less and less so if we toggle this on and off we see that you know right here where those lights are it's still doing a lot of sharpening because the transition is huge we're going from almost white to black whereas in these uh, areas outside the building the effect is much more muted than it was before so that's uh, basically how you use that. And again, threshold, there's no right answer for this. It's really just the nature of your image. If you've got a very low key image, um, that threshold will have to be higher. If you've got something with um, you know, a lot of variation like this, where you've got dark buildings on a light background, uh, then that threshold can be much lower. So that's basically the unsharp mask filter. I'm not even gonna apply that. Actually, you know what, let's, let's apply it. And then let's just talk about one more thing quickly, which is uh, once you've applied it to your layer, we can, uh, and this is why I like to either create a smart object or a separate layer, is that I can kind of toggle that on and off, zoom out, 
to particularly 100% because obviously that's you know what people are going to be if you're printing it that's what you're going to see is you're going to see 100%. So let's um, toggle that on and off, see how that looks, uh, check the effect, and you know what? Let's say we we get to it and we decide it's a little too much, we can always just reduce our opacity down. So let's say we you know take it down to 80%. And generally what I tend to do is anytime I apply sharpening, I sharpen it. I get it to the point where I think it looks good and then I take off about 20 to 25 percent because generally I find that we have a tendency to overdo things so um, it's best to just back it off a little bit after that. So let me just delete this layer. I'm going to duplicate it one more time hitting command J and now we're going to go to filter, sharpen, and smart sharpen. Now a lot of people they sort of say that you know smart sharpen is just um, a more intelligent version of unsharp mask which uh, in effect is true it has gone through a number of revisions so depending on what version of Photoshop you're using it may be better in quality or worse in quality now in Photoshop CC it is really very good um, it's improved to the point where rather than using unsharp mask for output sharpening I will typically use smart sharpen instead uh, because it does do a quite a good job of actually removing noise as well so this slider I don't believe was available in CS6 I think it's only in CC and it does actually do a nice job of kind of cleaning up some of the noise that is created by the sharpening process. Now uh, here you'll notice again our mount slider works the same way as it does in unsharp mask. Radius again same effect. We don't have the threshold because once again the smart sharpen is trying to kind of intelligently determine where it should be sharpening and where it shouldn't be sharpening. So we don't actually have that. And then we also have this um, this remove options. What are we actually trying to remove? So Gaussian blur is essentially just saying okay remove general blur so that's kind of your, your default value you know if you were using unsharp mask that's kind of what you get lens blur is saying okay find me the blur that is characteristic of lens softness and remove only that and then motion blur is if you've got you know something moving within your frame and maybe you didn't use quite fast enough of a shutter speed uh, then it will try and correct that now obviously if your object is completely blurred out then it's not going to work um, but it's if you've got some minor motion blur in there it can be fixed so a lot of people, again, they think of this smart sharpen as more of a corrective sharpening, whereas unsharp mask is sort of a generic sharpening. Now, I, again, with Photoshop CC, I think that's changed a bit, and for me, it's really just become my de facto output sharpening tool. You can also control here with a little bit more detail, so you get more granularity than you do with the um, unsharp mask in that you can control uh, how much sharpening gets uh, gets done within the shadows, you know, what is the tonal width of your shadow, uh, and then, you know, your highlights as well, so you can independently control it within those two separate um, uh, areas. Again, I don't tend to play around with this too much when I'm output sharpening. Um, very rarely do I make adjustments here. I primarily just stick to this uh, this top portion, and I remove Gaussian blur. So that's basically it for smart sharpen. Now, um, Again, you know, a lot of people tend to use Smart Sharpen or Unsharp Mask uh, within their actual editing workflow. As I mentioned, I don't use it in my editing workflow. I only use it for output sharpening. Throughout my workflow, I tend to use the um, the high pass filter. So we're going to look at a bunch of different variations of high pass filter sharpening and um, how you can apply it using various blend modes uh, within your layer. So the best way to look at Unsharp Mask is to kind of think of it as um, the opposite of a blur effect. So if we take this layer here and we go to filter, other, high pass, and we apply a decent amount of high pass here, let's say about 15 pixel radius, and then we apply a blend mode of soft light, then we see that we get you know a fairly sharp image here if we toggle this on and off. Now if we hit command I on that, now we see that we get this almost soft focus like effect. So essentially um, what what high pass is doing is it's kind of taking that and inverting it and instead of blurring it's sharpening. So not that you really need to know that but it's just kind of um, a little bit non-intuitive to look at the high pass what, what sort of gets created by the high pass um, so it's a good way to think of it is that it really is just kind of rolling back what um, a blur would do. So now let's go back to what we had here actually we're going to just step back a few steps back to our original uh, layer. So let's talk about the high pass itself and, and you know how we actually create them. So first thing you need to do is you need to create a duplicate layer in order to apply the high pass effect onto. So whatever layer it is that you want to apply it to, uh, select that layer, hit command J and that will create a duplicate for you. Next thing that is recommended is when you are operating on um, creating any sort of high pass filter you should go into image adjustments, brightness and contrast 
and take the contrast all the way down to negative 50. Uh, the reason for that is that the high pass filter does not operate very well on um, very deep shadows or very bright highlights. So what we're trying to do is kind of neutralize those by taking a lot of the contrast out of the image. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to go into the actual uh, filter other high pass um, filter option and we're going to apply our high pass filter. Now um, again high pass filter very basic in terms of what you can do with it. You just have one slider which controls the degree of the high pass filtering. So as you can see what high pass essentially does is it creates a neutral gray layer with certain bits of the image coming through. So where we have our sky that had almost no detail, we see that there's really nothing coming through. We've got a 50% gray layer, which, you know, whenever you think 50% gray layer, you're thinking the um, soft light overlay, hard light, uh, vivid light, and linear light blend modes, um, because obviously those tend to not do anything wherever there is 50% uh, gray, and wherever it's lighter, they tend to make things lighter, and it's where, wherever it's darker than 50% gray, it tends to make your image darker. So really what we're doing again is in the end, we're adding contrast to the image through the high pass filter. So the radius here is, um, like I said, very simple tool itself, but it, where, where it gets interesting is how you actually combine it with the radius and the different blend mode options we have. So starting off, um, if you want to just sharpen the image, what I'll typically do is I will um, start with a, a radius in between 0.5 pixels and 1.5 pixels. So as you can see, at one pixel radius, we barely see anything here. There's just some faint edging showing up. And you know the great thing about this filter is that it allows you to isolate the sharpening effect from the rest of your image. So you can really um, control it without actually having to deal with any other elements within your image. All we're left with is just the sharpening piece. And if we really zoom into this, we can see that the sharpening is doing exactly what we talked about is wherever on the edge here um, it's it's making things lighter because we know again if we blend anything with soft light or overlay whatever is lighter than neutral gray is going to get lighter so that's essentially what it's going to do and then this area here we see that it's darker so that's going to essentially um, darken that piece so just like we talked about sharpening in general it's doing exactly that it's going wherever there's an edge and it's lightening everything on the lighter side and darkening whatever is there on the darker side and as we boost the radius it's doing exactly what we did with the unsharp mask it's increasing the uh, the amount of pixels that are affected by that lightening and darkening now you know whereas with unsharp mask if we went up to like a 10 pixel radius we would never ever use that because it looked terrible with the high pass we actually can but um, let's let's defer that a little bit until we look at some of the different blend modes and let's just start with our one pixel sort of standard sharpening now I tend to use between 0.5 and 1.5 at my full resolution of 36 megapixels. So if you've got a smaller um, resolution on your camera, let's say you've got 12 megapixels, basically take that by a third, so you would be using about 0.5 pixel radius. Uh, if you've got something in between, like a 20 megapixel, um, you'd probably go up closer to one and below that. So let's start with one pixel. And so again, you know, we've, we've sharpened that, and obviously it doesn't look good in its current state, so now we have to apply one of the different blend modes that we have. So again, these are the blend modes that you have available to you when working with a 50% gray layer. So um, you can start with any of them. What I'll typically start with is vivid light when I'm sharpening at a one pixel radius. So with vivid light and one pixel radius, it gives us almost like a um, almost like the unsharp mask tool. Uh, it's giving us just a nice punchy sharpness. Uh, but again, the good thing is that we're not really doing anything within these areas. So um, you know, again, if we reverted back to that, we saw that this was all gray. Um, it's having no effect on that whatsoever. Now, um, a couple other options we have is uh, we've got the linear light blend mode as well, which we see is even more intense. So with this one here, we're creating um, a rather aggressive sharpening, which very rarely looks good. I never really use linear light when I'm blending with high pass. Uh, for high pass, I tend to stick with either overlay, soft light, hard light, or vivid light. So back with vivid light here, we see that we, you know with, with linear light, we just created a lot of noise in these shadows. In this case, it's a little bit better. So that's basically my, my standard um, sharpening approach. If I'm trying to globally sharpen my image, I'll, I'll stick to about 0.5 to 1.5 pixel radius um, high pass at, uh, with a vivid light blend mode. Now, where it gets interesting is we can sort of experiment with some different radiuses under the soft light or overlay blend mode. So let's just take that off, um, duplicate our layer one more time. I'm gonna go to filter, other, high pass actually before we do that let's just apply our soft light blend mode because this one is a little bit more experimental I do like to have soft light selected first so that once I actually start applying my high pass I can uh, experiment with increasing that radius and seeing what the effect is going to be 
So let's just zoom out a little bit, get a slightly more global view of things. And let's just go into around 10 pixels here. So with 10 pixels, we see that um, we're basically applying, you know, almost like a clarity effect. Uh, so, you know, the clarity slider inside of Camera Raw, that's almost what we're doing here when we're applying with soft light because um, it's a very gentle and more progressive sort of um, uh, blend mode as, as opposed to the, the vivid light or linear light where it's going to be very punchy and obviously um, with a 10 pixel radius it's going to create a lot of fringing for us so we don't want that. So let's apply it at 10 pixels and let's take a look at sort of what effect we've got here. So if we toggle that on and off we see that this uh, particular blend mode at 10 pixel radius has done a great job of bringing out these windows. So um, you know where before they were all kind of washed together now we see that distinctly we can see each and every one of the windows in these buildings. So really nice effect for that. Um, if we zoom out, let's try and apply soft light again at a different radius. So we're going to create one more layer, uh, essentially duplicating our background layer. Go to Filter, Other, High Pass. And now we're going to go all the way up to 100 pixels, which you know obviously you would never do with, um, with a standard blend mode. So we're going to click OK. Again, go back into soft light blend mode. And now what we can see is that it has, you know, applied this high pass at a very large pixel radius. So essentially we're, we're lightening a very large area and we're darkening a very large area. So if we toggle that on and off, we see that we're, we're getting a little bit lighter around the buildings. We're getting darker inside the building. So that's not necessarily what we want there. But we see that the effect itself is not too bad on the water. So if, again, we're just, just globally zoom out here we go in and out, um, it does actually create a nice textured effect on the water if, of course, that's what we're going for. Also, it does tend to punch up clouds quite nicely. And so with the uh, 100 pixel radius, I would traditionally apply that selectively. So I would hold down my option key, add my layer mask, and now I would go in and uh, grab my gradient tool with white, and I'm just going to paint down. Actually, that's the opposite, so let me just flip that around. Okay, there we go. So now we've got white um, where the water is, and then I'm just going to do a swatch here to bring it out of my clouds. And so now if we kind of toggle that on and off, we see that we apply that, that effect only to the water and to the cloud. Now we can bring it back in our uh, skyline. So now again, we're, we're bringing out those lights a little bit more, and then we can bring back our vivid light sharpening layer to really define our edges. So let's just group all that together, toggle on and off, and we see, you know, globally, it sort of takes the whole image and tightens it up a lot. Now, if we zoom in to 100%, which is always good practice whenever you're, you're sharpening, go in about 100 or 200% just to verify, we see that we're not doing too badly in terms of fringing. If we just toggle on and off, um, the fringing is relatively well controlled, but the image is getting a little bit crunchy, and we do see that we are getting a little bit of noise in here. So at 100%, it's actually not too bad. We don't really notice that noise, but um, what I will typically do is once I apply all of my different high pass sharpening layers, again, I'll group them together, and then I'll drop the opacity um, to at least 50%. Then at this point, if we kind of go back and forth between that, um, while this looked good on a, on a wide scale, uh, if we look at it close up and we go at a 50% level, we see that this is a little bit more natural and it's um, it's not quite as messy as it was at 100%. So 50% would be really my high point. Um, typically, I'll go down to around 30%. And if we kind of zoom back out and, um, and toggle off that group, we can still see how that effect applies. It's still just gently kind of tightening everything up and defining some of these lights and the edges around the skyline. So again, when it comes to high pass filtering, just experiment with the different blend modes. Uh, with overlay and soft light, you can be much more aggressive in your radius. With things like uh, the vivid light, you generally, uh, vivid light and hard light, you generally have to stick to around you know, 1, 1 1.5 pixels, 2 pixels max, uh, and again, always look towards reducing your opacity at the end, just to prevent any noise from happening. And again, we, you know, we briefly mentioned output sharpening, so when you're putting your image out for the web, you're going to apply a layer of uh, smart sharpen to the image, in which case you don't need to make it perfectly sharp at full scale. You're going to be doing some additional sharpening when you're, when you're sending it for output. Now the last um, sharpening option we're going to look at is a little bit more advanced and it's um, considered to be sort of the the best quality and um, you know it gets around some of the problems that high pass has in terms of uh, you know capturing areas of um, a very 
high, bright highlights and very dark shadows and that is essentially using the frequency separation we've talked about before um, but only using the high frequency portion of it um, and sort of tossing away the low frequency. So to sharpen with frequency separation, we're going to say, essentially take the same process that we do when we're retouching with frequency separation, which is to create two copies of our layer. So hit Command J twice with the layer selected. We're going to name our top one high, bottom one low, and we're going to turn the high one off for a minute here. So we're going to go into Filter, Blur, and Gaussian Blur. Now, typically when we're retouching with frequency separation, the amount of blur uh, isn't quite as important because we're always reversing that effect using the apply image technique that we're going to be doing in a second. Uh, but here it does become quite important because ultimately the amount of blur that we apply is going to affect the amount of sharpening that's going to happen. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but basically you can think of the blur radius as being the same as the high pass radius. So all those same things apply if we're going to be blending with a linear light or vivid light blend mode, we're going to want to stick with a small radius of 0.5 to 1.5. If we're going to blur with something, or if we're going to, sorry, if we're going to blend with something that is a little bit um, more subtle like the soft light or overlay blend modes, then we can look at applying a higher radius like 10 pixels all the way up to 100 pixels. Now again, as before, depending on the resolution of your camera, you're going to have to, you know, correspondingly adjust those numbers. But uh, in this case, let's just start with our 1.5 pixel um, blur amount, which is essentially going to apply a 1.5 pixel high pass in the end. So we're going to click OK there. That's going to blur our image. We're next going to turn on our high frequency layer, and we're going to go to Image, Apply Image, and we're going to have Add as our blending mode. We're going to have Scale as 2, Invert checked off, and we're going to use our low layer as our source layer. Now again, these are 16-bit image values. If you've got an 8-bit image, um, the values are a little bit different, so um, I'll provide a link in the blog post for this video um, where you can find the values for an 8-bit image. So we're going to click OK there. And now if we actually zoom into this, we see that um, this looks awfully similar to what we saw with high pass, where essentially we have got these little areas where contrast is going to increase. And just as before, uh, we're essentially applying a, a middle gray layer. So everything is more or less the same as with the high pass. The difference is that the actual source image produced by this is a little bit higher quality because it does use the full um, dynamic range, you know, including the, the brightest of the highlights and the darkest of the shadows. So it gets around some of the uh, quality issues that we have with the high pass filter. So now if we apply this uh, with a linear light blend mode, which is typical for what we're going to do with um, high, free, uh, high pass sorry, uh, frequency separation retouching, we would normally make this a linear light blend mode. Uh, in this case, if we kind of toggle it on and off with linear light, we have essentially no difference. Now, what we're doing though is because we want to sharpen, we don't really care about the low layer, which contains mostly our colors, we can just toss that away. And now what we're left with is a layer that's going to sharpen our image. So now if we toggle this group on and off, we see that you know the image does in fact become much sharper. So if we zoom in here, we now have the latitude to change the blend mode as well. Normally we can't change the blend mode when we're doing frequency separation because then um, the low and the high group together will not produce the same effect as our output image. But in this case, we're actually just looking to sharpen. So we can go to a vivid light blend mode, for example, to make the effect a little bit more subtle. And now again, toggling on and off, we see that we get our sharpening effect. So um, it does produce quite a nice clean effect, just like the high pass, but again, um, I tend to find that it's a little bit higher in quality than what the high pass produces. So uh, once again, if you you know, if we were initially blurred at around 10 or 15 pixels, we could use a soft light blend mode here. In this case, if I chose soft light, the effect becomes very small. So um, I just didn't want to really demonstrate that under this particular blur radius. So just remember, we're really doing the same thing as with high pass, but a couple more steps involved. Um, you can essentially assign an action for it, create three different variations, you know, uh, vivid light sharpen, soft light sharpen, soft light sharpen high. So vivid light would be 0.5 to 1.5 pixels and the soft light would be either a 10 or up to 100 pixels. So if you just want to automate that process, create an action to record those steps and generate it for you. So that's basically um, the frequency separation approach. Again, everything that you did with high pass applies here. Uh, it's just the process of getting there is a little bit different. Now, one last thing we're going to look at is um, Adobe Photoshop uh, CC does include a motion blur 
uh, or I should say a, um, a camera shake removal tool. So if we go into sharpen, there's a shake reduction tool, uh, which is actually kind of interesting. Let me just duplicate this layer here. It does work pretty well, but um, it does often produce an image that is a little bit crunchy. Now, again, this works best when you actually do have camera shake, and I've actually tried it with uh, images that have a fair bit of camera shake blur, and it does a, a rather admirable job of, uh, of fixing it. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to take a sample area, and it's going to try and find the direction of any sort of camera shake. So it's going to finish that up, and it's going to create... Um, a preview for us here. So let's just um, apply that with whatever default values we have. This process does take a little while, so um, you do have to be patient with it. And generally my finding with it is that it does sharpen the image quite well, but it does also lead to a fair bit of artifacting, uh, more so than a high pass uh, filter wood or using something like Unsharp Mask. So now that we're done, uh, basically if we kind of toggle this layer on and off, we see that it does sharpen it quite dramatically. Uh, the one thing you do have to be aware of is that it does tend to shift your image as well, because if it interprets that there was a, an up to down movement, then it's going to try and fix it by either shifting the whole image up or shifting it down. And also, as you can see, uh, it is a little bit crunchy on the edges, but it does do a pretty good job of actually sharpening, because if we go back to this... Um, high pass sharpening that we we have up here and we change that back into something like linear light we see in this area right here for example that it's it's fairly sharp but if we turn this off and put on this one it actually does define these fine lines quite nicely um, so it brings back a lot of the detail that's lost so um, while I typically you know the general application of this is to fix motion blur um, this image was shot on a tripod and yet still uh, it was able to kind of you know redo some of the subtle motions that may have occurred in the camera while it was on the tripod and really sharpen up some of these areas. But again, um, you know, there is quite a bit of artifacting. If we look at this version here, this is quite smooth and it's, you know, sort of just the right amount of um, of sharpness within these points. Whereas if we go back to this one here, it's it's a little bit rough and, um, you know, doesn't always look great. So we can, of course, always bring down our opacity there just to, uh, just to mute that effect a little bit, or we can selectively uh, mask things out. So again, I'm showing you that uh, in there because it does seem to have applications beyond just um, fixing actual camera shake. Uh, it can be used as just a standard sharpening uh, approach within your image workflow. Now we're going to finish up just by looking at some sharpening for portraits. So for this one, I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. Let me get rid of some of these layers. So I've got a stamp visible layer here. And we're going to go ahead and apply two uh, high pass sharpening approaches to this particular image. So we're going to just again duplicate this twice here. And I'm going to turn off this layer, and this one we're going to blend with soft light. We're going to go into filter, other high pass. And one thing I find is really nice with the high pass uh, under soft light approach is that, uh, again, if we go into this sort of uh, 10 pixel range, we see that it really starts to bring out some of the detail within the face, like um, you know, detail around the lips, um, within the eyes. The freckles really pop out. The hair texture really comes out. So if we just apply this at, let's say, 10 pixels here, and we toggle it on and off, we see that, again, we're creating this, this nice amount of depth within the face, um, something that we really didn't have before. Um, we had a lot of softness. And with this, it really brings those details back out. Now we can do the same thing with the uh, standard sort of um, vivid light approach. We can again blend that with vivid light, go to filter, other, high pass, oh, not maximum, wrong one, filter, other, high pass. And from here, we're going to pick again our radius, which was you know standard around uh, 1 to 1.5 pixels. And again, we see that that just brings in some of the detail within the hair and the eyes. Now in both cases, what I may do is um, just with this one here, I may want to use that to bring out some of the freckles, so I'll add um, a black layer mask, I'll hold down Option, add layer mask, and then just choose a white brush, and we're going to brush in areas, for example, where we have uh, some freckles, maybe around the lips a little bit as well. And we see if we just toggle that on and off, it just adds a lot more pop to the skin texture and really brings the skin texture out. With this layer, for example, we may choose to, again, I'm just going to add a black layer mask, we may just choose to bring out some more detail in the eye. So we just brush that in that area and toggle on and off. 
and again we see that we're just defining some of the details within the eye there and you know we can really apply this anywhere we can add a little bit more within the lips and add a lot of uh, additional sharpening in the hair similarly on this layer we can just bring out some of this hair here and just grouping these together toggling on and off we see that you know the effect is subtle but we're just bringing out some more detail in the freckles some more texture in the face and things of that nature so uh, just as with uh, with landscape images architecture images the same techniques apply but one thing you'll always be doing with portraits is applying them selectively because we never really want to sharpen everything on the skin we're always going to be primarily focusing on areas of interest so within the portrait we generally want to draw people into details like the eyes the lips and the hair so that's really where you're going to be selectively sharpening your images so again we've gone through a ton of different sharpening techniques uh, hopefully you know again I didn't really discuss when you would use one versus the other because um, you know it really just depends on the image uh, that you have at hand but as I mentioned before I generally apply either high pass or frequency separation sharpening during my workflow and then stick with unsharp mask and smart sharpen uh, during the output stage uh, and then um, you know with portraits it's the same process but I generally do not output sharpen uh, portraits because uh, we don't really want to make them too crunchy we want to always leave portraits um, a little bit softer than we would an architecture or landscape image. So again, thank you for watching, and uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below, and also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash VibrantShot. We'll see you next time. Wow, you made it all the way through to the end of the video. Well, for that, I'm going to give you a little bonus tip uh, when using unsharp masks. So what you can do is um, we're going to take our layer that we want to sharpen, and we're going to duplicate it twice by hitting uh, Command-J twice, or Control-J if you're on a PC. Then with the top layer selected, we're going to go to Filter, Sharpen, Unsharp mask, and we're going to pump up our amount to about 150 at a radius of 1.5 pixels. So now with that, if we actually zoom into this area, we see that we are getting into a little bit of white fringing um, in the transition point between the sky, and that's going to be common anytime you have a you know a darker uh, subject against a light sky. So what we can do to get rid of that fringe is we can go into our blend modes and set that blend mode to darken. And what it will essentially do is it will take away that fringe and just essentially add some sharpening um, in the shadows around the highlight, but it won't touch the highlights. Now what we can do is we can go into this layer here, go into Sharpen, Unsharp Mask, and then we're going to change our amount to around 80 with a radius of 1 pixel. Click OK. And now we're going to set that blend mode to Lighten. So now if we combine those two together and we toggle on and off, we see that we're getting that sharpening effect, but we're kind of controlling the fringing a little bit better here. So we can also obviously vary the intensity of each of these layers by adjusting the opacity, but at least we're, we're controlling the additional contrast on either side. So remember that, that sharpening um, will lighten the lights and darken the darks anytime there's an edge. So now we can kind of independently vary the intensity of that effect. So hope you enjoyed that little bonus tip and we'll see you next time.